Hello. I'm Paul Foss, the men's ministry pastor and outreach director here at Damascus Road. And truthfully, looking out in the auditorium right now and seeing faces, beautiful faces. I'm talking about Nan, not you, John. <laughs> Smiling faces. I'm sure they are behind those masks. It's just so good to be back together. It's a relief. You know, the last couple of times I've preached, I've preached to an empty room. It's pretty weird. So, being together in the room for worship, feeling the Spirit pushing His way into our hearts, feeling the overflow from each of you. I've missed you. Chris, front row Chris, Debbie, Michael, it's just so good to see you here tonight. So those of us who are joining us online, thank you for being faithful. Thank you for continuing to gather together in his name. And next week, as you heard, we're opening up for in-person church. We are getting so excited about that. So those of you who are comfortable for taking that step, be sure to get to our webpage and sign up. Starting next week, I already know Chris Horn has signed up. He's already jumped on it, so you need to get in line. So this week, we are in our fifth week in a series that has been near and dear to my heart, Love Where You Live. As I was thinking about the series title, can I just for a minute play with that title just for a second? What if we called the series Love Lives Where You Live? Can I do this? Is that cool? So imagine with me love moving into the neighborhood. Now, if you want the whole story, look at 1 Corinthians 13. But here's the story. The moving truck pulls up out front, and the movers start unpacking the truck. Which room does patience go in? Hey, how about not boasting and not being proud? Where does that go? Hey, I got a box full of kindness here. Where does that go? All right, Facebook. That makes sense. What about this never fails box? I mean, this thing feels like a ton. Never fails. I mean, is there really such a thing? You said faith and hope were sharing a bedroom, right? Now, I'm assuming love gets put in the entire house, spread all over, right? Since that's the greatest one. Anyway, love where you live. Five weeks ago, Regender started off this series inviting us to close the knowing and the doing gap in our lives. We have the information and the knowledge because we all know the great commandment, Love God and love your neighbor. But too often there's a gap between the knowing and the doing. In fact, my mentor once told me that we've taught our folks to listen to sermons but not apply truth. But not you. Last week, Richard invited us to help stock the shelves at Mount Airy Net. Now, by the way, we live in an unbelievably generous community. Richard didn't mean to say that we're the primary partner, but we are excited to be one of many partners which have provided funding, volunteers, food drives over the years. Well done. Here's a cool story. I got a panicked call from Danita last Sunday saying, the drop-off container's overflowing, we have animals outside the building, they're coming for the food. Is there any way we can get hold of somebody to get this food? That's a really cool story, well done. Here's another one. I was at the church this past Tuesday for a meeting, and during that hour, three cars, middle of the afternoon, three cars drove up and dropped off food donations. So in speaking with our very own Sue Vera as the director of Mount Airy Net, she expressed her gratitude for the way her home church supports the net, and she made one more crucial request. So pay attention to this. So far, the net has signed up 99 families for a Thanksgiving meal. Along with those requests have come fragments of their stories. There's seniors, there's single parents, there's widows, there's grandparents, there's Hispanic families. And truthfully, there's just an awful lot of anxiety, there's a lot of fear, and there's just an awful lot of heartbreak. So here's the request. Would you join with me in praying for these hurting and struggling families? Closing the knowing and the doing gap. Well done. For those of you who haven't jumped in yet, come on in, the water's fine. Richard pointed out that Jesus himself said that all of scripture hangs on two commands, wholeheartedly loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. And then he made three asks. Remember this, love your neighbor, learn your neighbor's names, learn their stories, and then pray for them by name. That was the challenge he's given to each one of us. So David gave Chris 
David gives Chris flowers every week. I'm just saying, husbands, step it up. Chris decided to take these flowers and put them in a vase and share them with their neighbor. This past week, the neighbor knocked on their door and expressed how much the flowers meant to her. A conversation started. They told each other parts of their story. An invitation to a meal was offered. We love our neighbors because we're Christians, not to try to make them Christians. By the way, if you have a great neighboring story, we're all beginning to gather those. Please post them on our damascus.com slash neighbor. We'd love to hear your stories. We'd love to revel in them with you. Love has moved into the Bueller house and it's coming for all their neighbors. For those of us who would like to take the next right step in closing the knowing and doing gap, I want you to grab your phone. It's cool. We're in church. I know. Grab your phone and download this app, blesseveryhome.com. It's okay. This one time. This app well, it's a free app. We'll identify your 40 closest neighbors by name, and, they will, and it will send you a daily reminder to pray for five of them every single day. This has been a game changer for me. Since Jeannie and I have started closing the knowing and doing gap in our neighborhood, now when we walk over to visit our grandkids, there are people yelling a greeting from the balcony. A single mom is asking me to talk to her son. We've gotten to know a young woman who works for the Secret Service. I can't tell you where she lives. Ha <laughs> ha. Even cooler, Jeannie is ex exchanging weekly texts with her now. Kinship, compassion. My neighbor Brad has asked me if he can do some Jesus stuff with me. And I just learned that we have a prayer partner that using the same app that lives just a block away from me. So now I have an ally in my neighborhood. Living in our neighborhood now is so much more cool than it used to be. You see, love is moving into Westview South. So download blesseveryhome.com because it's super cool. Week three, Armando drew three lessons from the Good Samaritan story. Loving our neighbor means being interruptible. Loving our neighbor means being willing to burden ourselves for them. He reminded us that Calvary declares that every person has infinite value and worth. So we need to look past the facts and see the person. A few weeks ago, I invited you to partner with a recovery high school here in Frederick, the Phoenix Foundation. Dave Dunlevy signed up to provide a transportation one day a week for a young man who needed a ride to school. The kid's mom is still stuck in addiction and tragically, right now, she just can't be there for her son. On the way to pick this young man up, Dave was praying this prayer to God. Would you give me some connection point with this young man? I mean, otherwise, he was thinking, it's a long 40-minute trip each way, week after week, old guy, young guy. It could be very potentially awkward. So the young man jumps in the car, and almost before David knew what was happening, they figured out that they were both dirt bike guys. They both loved mechanical stuff. Kinship, rich conversations, leading to loving, actually leading to fathering just a little bit. Interruptible. It costs something. Looking past the facts to the person. Yes. See, love is moving into Dave's car, into the neighborhood. Last week, Richard invited us to the, to surrender, to the surrender that God is offering because only through giving over to God what is truly too heavy to bear can we be free to love. He offered us this Christian doctrine called common grace, where everyone has some godlike qualities, and so often we discover that more blessings come our way across this neighboring bridge than go the other direction from us. Some weeks ago, a group of us showed up at uh, Regendra's place to cut a tree down that had been damaged in a storm. We, as we were all busy, a neighbor caught Regendra's attention to ask what was going on. Who are these people? They're having way too much fun. Regendra explained that we were some friends from church, and the neighbor said, can I jump in? So he jumped on his John Deere riding mower, and he had a blast with the rest of us, which turned into an invitation to a meal, an Indian please. During the meal, Erica and Regendra learned that the wife had gone to a college that Ashlyn is considering. 
Suddenly we have kinship. Suddenly we see a two-way bridge. We find ourselves sharing common grace. Love is moving into the Palai neighborhood. As we have often said, loving where you live is not the flavor of the month. It's a continuation of a journey that we've been on for years. And having said that, we are determined now to be even more intentional than ever, more purposeful. After all, it's the entire story we live in. Jesus tells us the entire Christian story hinges on this, loving God and loving our neighbor. And it is exciting to know that so many of you are already all in. John could tell, John and Ann could tell dozens of stories already. Chris, for the rest of you who have not yet ventured out, come on in, the water's fine. All right, now let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you today that you have invited us into the greatest story that could possibly be. We get to, you allow us into this And for that, we're just grateful. So God, as we contemplate this together tonight, today, would you be with us? Would you open our hearts up? Would you soften us to hear, to know, and then to do all that you would have us do so that we could live a life of epic adventure following hard after you? And I pray that in Jesus' name. The people said, amen. So many of us, So many of our neighbors and so many of us are hurting and struggling right now. The number of overdose deaths in our addiction community is surging. Our Haven special needs families are trying to manage jobs and virtual school and the special challenges they bravely face day in and day out, and they are weary. They're feeling stretched. The number of families in our community who are struggling to keep a roof over their heads and food on their table is growing by leaps and bounds particularly those who are most vulnerable. The sense of isolation is causing suicide rates to skyrocket. The political discourse has become so deeply dividing and shrill, friends, our neighbors are hurting and struggling. So how do we neighbor them through this? How can we neighbor those in our church? How can we close the knowing and the doing gap here? As I was praying over this, God brought me to a very familiar passage. It's in Matthew 25. I'm talking about the sheep right now. Here we go. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and he'll put the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. It almost seems like Jesus was looking down the corridor of time and he saw the pandemic of 2020, closing the knowing and the doing gap. So Ajay, tell us what you've been up to for the last eight months. First of all, sir, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to you wonderful people in the congregation, Ms. Lawrence, the Rickards, the Raiders, the Falses, the entire Damascus Road Community Church has opened up their arms and turned this kingdom into a place of empowerment for our mentor program over the last 16 weeks. And we are forever grateful and thankful for all of you guys. Over the last 33 weeks, our organization, not me, not I, we, this community coming together have been able to provide critical grocery needs to 33,000 patrons in need. See, some of us don't know and understand how much this pandemic is affecting others. There are people that are hopeless, and because of the hearts of gratitude of you all, we are able to bring hope into their homes through critical grocery needs. So why do you keep doing it? How long have you done it now, and and why do you keep doing it? 33 weeks. 
I do it because helping people keeps me away from the people, places, and things that once made my life unmanageable. <laughs> See, I surrendered to God. At one point, I drove the car, wrecked it every time. <laughs> now I gave the keys to God and I allow him to work the vehicle and I just use the brakes and the gas. Yeah. So he puts me in the field to serve his people. <laughs> well, well done. That's worth an applause. Yeah, anybody here resonate with that, uh, who's driving the car? Hear the king say, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was sick, and you gave me something to eat for 35 weeks and counting. As Armando said, Aji and his team have been willing to burden themselves. By the way, Damascus Road, well done. Because of your generosity, we've been able to partner with IBM, and together we're looking past the facts and we're seeing the person we're seeing those who are in need, the hundreds and the thousands of nameless, hurting, struggling neighbors. I was a stranger, many strangers from a distant land, living in a strange land. They're all living in the shadows. They're hungry, and they're hurting, and they're alone. 33,000 families have come hungry and been served Ajay calls that hope dealing. Amen. Ajay realized at some point that on top of the COVID, the flu season was coming, and that many, actually most of those in line for the food, had no access to already existing vaccine for flu. So classic Ajay, he reaches out to the health department, and now hundreds of vulnerable folks are getting their flu vaccine. They're being saved from a two-headed monster, COVID and flu season, they and their children. Many, I've got to tell you this, many have their dad sitting in the car because he's too ashamed and alone. He's doing all he can, but it's hard and it's embarrassing. Hope dealing isn't easy. It costs eight plus months, rain, heat, the grind. The only thing harder truthfully, would be doing nothing. I was hungry. I am hungry. I was thirsty. I am thirsty. And you gave, and you continue to give. I was in prison. Ajay, tell us about your encounter with Jesus in prison, and then that second encounter with Jesus last Sunday. Absolutely. At one point in my time, I wasn't always a member of the community. I was once a menace to our community. Hurt people hurt people. So I chose to hurt myself with the actions that I brought forth, and I hurt my peers in this community. And that took me to some dark places, 20 years, all suspended by eight years in the penitentiary. In that space, I was mad at a lot of people. I was mad at the judge. I was mad at my mom, I was mad at my dad, mad at everybody but the right person, which was me, because I was the one that committed those crimes and had to pay those consequences. So every day or every time I go into the courthouse, I go up on the second floor and there's a lady named Judge Salt, I thank her for saving my life. Because in that prison stay, it was a night where I laid on my bunk bed and I was a, always an energetic guy. I always liked to go in the yard. I always liked to cook. I always liked to be on the phone. I always liked to watch movies. I liked to be out and about dealing hope. So in this, in this, my bunk buddy keeps saying up, hey, you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. He's like, man, you ain't been out that bunk bed all day. And I'm like, man, I'm good. So the next morning came, he asked me the same question. He said, I'm about to call the medic because something ain't right with you. You don't lay in that bunk that, that long. But for me, what it was, it was God. God had me paralyzed in my bunk bed. He wouldn't allow me to move because he knew what was next for me, another prison stay or a cemetery. In that, he asked me a question. That question was, do I believe in myself? See, I'm no good to anybody if I don't believe in myself. And he wouldn't let me move in that paralyzation until I answered. So that night turned into another day until I gave an answer. And when I gave an answer, I heard a voice that says, hey, I just don't want lip service. I want action. Mm. So in that action, today I can tell you we operate a mentor program with 54 young men and women trying to give back 
and prevent these young people from entering in the dark space that I chose to enter and help them get into avenues of the light. Tell us about last Sunday. Last Sunday, this guy always takes me on an adventure. <laughs> See, in the Bible, it talks about adventure. See, we don't understand that God's kingdom is an adventure. Yep. Walking this walk is an adventure. Yep. So a couple months back, Mr. Falls asked me, he said, hey, I need you to go somewhere with me a weekend. Let God answer if you're going to go. I don't want you to answer. Let God answer. So I thought it over, and I'm like, how am I going to go away for a whole weekend? My daughter, the kids in the program, just a lot of things that I'm responsible for. So I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, boss. He's like, oh, you're doing it. You're coming. I'm like, okay, I'm there. So God told me the weekend before that I needed to be there. He wanted me to be there. And all weekend long, it was just so peaceful. It was just so pleasant. But honestly, I didn't know why I was there. I really didn't know. I knew I believed in God. I know I fear God. But God puts us, God doesn't make mistakes. He puts us in places for a reason. So Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday comes, and it was the last session. <laughs> and I took the whole box of handkerchiefs. Let's just say that. I didn't share them. I didn't ask any, because everybody in the room was crying. I had my own box. Including, I was looking down at boss. He was crying, but <laughs> I, I literally reached down and grabbed the whole box and pulled it up because it was a time in that session where God came to me and he said, say it. you're not doing enough. And I look around, and I'm like, God, there's no way you're talking to me. I'm looking. No one's sitting next to me, though. And I'm like, would you say it again? And he said, you're not doing enough. So the tears, they become to come down even faster. Couldn't even, snot was coming out my nose. I could hardly breathe. Mm -hmm. So after the session at this wonderful, amazing retreat, you have a 30-minute reflection where you leave after the session and you don't talk to anybody, it's silence, you talk to God. Mm -hmm. So I went back to my room and I rushed back to my room because I'm like, you really just said that to me? I hope you're still there to talk because I'm coming to get some alone time with you. So when I got in the room, I'm just sitting there waiting, waiting. I'm like, God, you said that to me? And he said, yes. He said, you're feeding my people. He said, you're helping the kids. You're living as a member of this community, but you're not bringing anybody to my word. See, I want them to eat off the fruitful tree. So you got to give them me. Yeah. All these kids within this program, you got to give them more of me. Mm -hmm. All of these parents that are, you are trying to help the brokenness and help break the generational curse, it starts with me. And that me isn't me, it's God. Yes. And being able to be at this retreat, I've learned that I got to give more. I got to dig into my Bible a little more every day and figure out how I can give the action that God called for me to do this weekend. So, brother, I thank you for allowing me to yeah. come to the Water Boys Retreat, and I'm a Water Boys Retreat member for life, bro. I love you, man. <laughs> yeah, well done. Man. Love you. Well done. Yeah, you're not doing enough because you're not telling them about me. See, Jesus will look past the facts to the person, and he's always coming. Like a, motive, like a locomotive, he will come. As Ajay was telling me last Sunday what he heard Jesus saying to him as John Conlon was talking about the true father, how it hit him like a ton of, trick, a ton of bricks, all I could think was, we get to do this. We don't have to do this. We get to do this. Dead men walking, coming alive. Men who are engaged beginning to see that there's even more to life. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Now, the King James is even stronger. It says, you did to me. Loving God and loving your neighbor. God, when did we do all this to you? We've just been loving where we live. 
We've just been getting to know our neighbor's names. We've just been getting to learn their stories. We've just been learning about their hurts. All we've really done is just prayed for them. So God, you've helped us to see that the circle of compassion is big enough that no one needs to find themselves outside the circle. Jesus, truthfully, we're racking our brains and we can't figure it out. Jesus, when did we do that? Jesus sits quietly with a big grin on his face. And just when we think he isn't going to answer our question, he leans in and he says, let me remind you of something, my son, my daughter. I've loved my father from before time. I've loved you before you were even born. You, you are my neighbor. Before you were knit in your mother's womb, I sang songs over you. I had you in mind from before time. I have loved you, neighbor, I have loved you as myself. It's just who I am. When I come on my rescue mission, brother, love will move into the neighborhood. We know Jesus. I mean, we're grateful that you did all that. We know all those things. But that isn't our question. When did we feed you? When were you thirsty? You in prison, Jesus? He speaks again. You did these things when you realized that you had been so radically loved by me, neighbor, that you couldn't help yourself. When I loved you, you simply loved in return. You couldn't help yourself because you're my child. You had to love your neighbor. I laughed out loud. It just seems too simple. Loving where I live out of an overflow of gratitude of being loving, of being rescued, that's it. Then I hear the first chords of a song. The song is coming for me. I realize I'm the hurting and the struggling one. I'm the one crying out in desperate need. And now I realize I can't separate my story from those I thought I was serving or from Jesus. I hear someone talking and I realize it's my own voice. I can't help it. I'm thanking Jesus. I bend my knee there at the cross. I look over and there my neighbor is weeping in gratitude, I look up and there's Jesus. And the song breaks into full throat and I'm captured by it. I listen, I start to sing. I look around and you're singing. This is your rescue story. This is my rescue story. It's our rescue story and now, and now, ah, it all makes sense. Loving God with my whole heart and loving my neighbor, it's because of the rescue story. Let's sing this song as a declaration, as a promise. Will you stand with me? Jesus, we are willing to close the knowing and the doing gap. Would you help us, Jesus?
never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You were my testimony. Yeah. You never gave up on me. No. You never gave up on me. You were my testimony. never give up on me. Have a seat. You never give up on me. That's my testimony. You pulled me up from the ashes, from death to life. You are, you are. Tony Campello was walking down a sidewalk in the mean streets of Philadelphia when he saw him coming, staggering just a little bit, the bum. Tony decided right then and there he was not going to make eye contact because he knew if he did, it was a $5 ask. And as he got closer and closer, the, the, the man approaching yelled out, Sir, here it comes, Sir, isn't it a beautiful day? And this is the best cup of coffee I think I've ever had. Do you want a drink? Tony said he wished he'd asked for $5. So he dropped his eyes, and he didn't make any more eye contact. He said, no, thanks. You know how we do. And we walked on by. Ten steps past the bum. God said, really? That was me offering you a drink. And Tony turned, and as he turned, he saw the face of Jesus. And he said, I would love to have a drink of coffee. And he went and he took this dirty cup of coffee out of the bum's hand, out of the son of God's hand, and he took a drink. And suddenly they experienced kinship. Suddenly they saw that their circle was wide enough for both of them to live in. Jesus hasn't eaten since the Last Supper, and he's weak. Jesus knows what the ache of hunger feels like. There is no one there to offer him even a crumb. But now, because of his testimony, we can now offer the bread of life to one and all. Come, there's plenty. He was beaten over and over again. Jesus lost so much blood that he became severely dehydrated. Jesus is thirsty. He asks for a drink and we give him vinegar. But now, but now living water wells up in us because of his testimony and it flows out of us into a thirsty and a dying world. This is our story. Jesus was a stranger, an immigrant really. In 1 John 1.11 it says he came to his own people and they rejected him. We rejected him. And now we realize that no one's a stranger. They're just a neighbor we haven't met yet a person with a name, a person with a story. You see, we look past the facts, Armand, we look past the facts and we see the person. This is a person who is worth emptying heaven for. And we love them and we take them in. He is stripped naked. He's bleeding and he's dying. I thought for a minute that I would offer him my filthy rags, but then I realized it wasn't gonna be nearly enough. Instead, he offers me his perfectly white robe of righteousness, and I realize that he, he is more than enough. 
He is soul sick from carrying the weight of separation from his father caused by all of the sins that I've committed, that you've committed. He is sick to death of sin, aren't you? He is taken prisoner by hate so he could set us free. Friends, we don't have to go to the hurting and the, and the struggling. We don't have to go. We get to. We don't have to be so radically loved, but we are. And because we are, we just can't help ourselves. Will you go with me? Out of gratitude, let's neighbor. Let's neighbor the hurting and the struggling. Here's the banquet that I'm offering you today. First, set up, sign up for that blesseveryhome.com. There's a direct link now on our app homepage. This is gonna help you learn your neighbors' names, their stories. It's gonna allow you to pray for them. I don't know how it all works, but it works. Start building the neighboring bridge. James tells us that pure religion is caring for the orphans and the widows. And we have identified several foster care families in our community who care for the temporary, sometimes permanent orphan. They care for them day after day, week after week, year after year. They are willing to burden themselves for these precious kids. They are looking past the facts every day to the person. And we've asked them, hey, can we just thank you for their love to these kids? by cooking them a home-cooked meal, and they were touched, these foster care families. Hey, somebody sees us, somebody cares, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, and they said, yes, yes, we would love that. Would you bring me a home-cooked meal? I can just have one day off. This is a one-and-done request. All you have to do is deliver a meal, thank them for being such good neighbors, and then bang, you can leave. Or maybe God will prompt you to keep bringing them a meal. Maybe God will prompt you to see them as your neighbor and love them, and kinship will break out. Loving where you live will happen. Love will move into the foster care family community. If you'd like to adopt one of these families for a nice home-cooked meal, go to our webpage or the chat thread and grab a family I'm just here to tell you, Damascus Road is going to take all 19 families quick. Don't lose your turn. Don't lose your blessing. We've also identified 15 foster care families who need some stuff done around their home. You know, yard work, minor repair stuff, maybe a little painting, a little carpentry. Enough for a small team to do all this in just a couple of hours. We've identified 15 foster care families. We already have 15 team captains, which means all the prep work will be done. All you have to do is show up. It's going to be, inter are you interruptible? Do you see these 15 families as your neighbor? We'll assign you to a team. We'll connect you to your team captain. And on November 14th at 8.30 a.m., you and your family will show up. And you, we, will serve Jesus. We will look into each family and looking again carefully, we will see the face of Jesus looking back at us. And uh, by the way, don't forget to continue to be hilariously generous with the food for Monterey Net. The Veras are coming on another emergency run tonight. Stretch them a little bit. Force Danita to call me again with the emergency help. Now, will you all stand with me? God, you let us, you invite us in, you pave the way. You showed us where, the hurting and the struggling. You showed us how, on your journey to the cross. You showed us that we were worth being interrupted for. We were worth looking past the facts. Here's the facts, we all screw up. We all keep screwing up. I'm going to screw up again today. And yet, God, you look past all of that, and you see me, you see us, and you see your son and your daughter, and you delight in us, and you dance, and you sing over us. Because that's who you are. That's who you are. That's our testimony. 
God, you have so radically loved us that we just can't help ourselves but to go and to take the time to learn their name and learn their story and to just pray for them, invite you into this space, God. You'll do the heavy lifting. God, help us to be willing. Help us to close the knowing and the doing gap. God, help us to see that the water's fine. Let's all just jump in. So God, thank you again for who you are and for what you've already done. And each one of us say yes. Thank you. We love you because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, and the saints said, amen. Amen.